Well, one of the things that uh, interests me is asking myself this. Uh, I, uh, what will we think 35 years on when we look back uh, on our systems as they are now? I started uh, as a lawyer in 1980, that's 37 years ago. Uh, and in that age, I would often hear it said, well, the children are better off without him. It was the same time, for instance, as the leading judgment on same-sex parents uh, referred to uh, a mother in a same-sex relationship as being involved in a perversion, uh, and <coughs> uh, where it was said uh, that uh, a child should only be placed with a mother in a same-sex relationship if no other solution was available to the court. And that's only 37 years ago. Well, what are they going to be saying about us now in 37 years' time. Uh, and I suspect the way we approach parenting uh, will, will be uh, a, a feature uh, of uh, how they will look back and think, how on earth did they just try and justify that? Now, you'll see on the uh, screen, uh, I've put the uh, label for this talk as being alienation, self-alienation, and validation. What I want to do though, is to stress five main points. The first is that it is essential where we are in this type of family dynamic to decide what's going on. There's got to be an early uh, decision about what is actually happening within the family. It may be parental alienation. It may be that actually that it is self-alienation where, for instance, a mother or a father has been so horrid, dangerous, uh, or, or damaging to the children that it's perfectly understandable that they don't want to see that parent, where a parent has alienated himself or herself from a family. Uh, that can happen. Or <coughs> where the parents are both engaging in validation. I found myself, uh, I have six children, uh, and I'm fortunate enough to be happily married. Um, but I found myself the other day saying to my 12-year-old, hasn't your mother got your rugby kit out yet? <laughs> I'll do it. Uh, and I thought, you complete idiot. Uh, what was I doing that for? My wife, who works as, uh, at least the same hours as I do as a family law, uh, solicitor, said, actually, I've done it already. But what I, I was feeling that I'd been compulsively working as ever, and I hadn't really been doing my, playing my role in the family. I was trying to build myself up. I was validating myself. Just think about how often you do that yourselves sometimes. Uh, it's easy to catch yourself doing it. So there are other concepts at play, and it's very important in that first stage when you're looking at what's happened to remember that, that it's an issue of fact. Once you've decided uh, what is happening, then the next stage must surely be get help for the problems that you've identified. And help in this environment must surely be help that will address the problems. And the problems are emotional, psychological, or indeed, I'm sure Cameron would say at times, psychiatric. That's what you've got to address. And until you address the emotional, psychological, or psychiatric difficulties that are leading to this complex dynamic, you're going to get nowhere. The third is be consistent. It is surely terribly damaging when uh, a judge has given a judgment after hearing a whole range of evidence for somebody to come in think I'm the real clever dick uh, I I in this dynamic uh, I can add really clever words of perception and actually take the case right back to the to its starting point there must be consistency amongst professionals and that's why I always insist for instance when there's been a judgment that there must be a transcript. How often do, do we forget what other judges have said in cases? So the one I've just done, there was a judgment in 2014. Nobody had the first clue what the judge had said at that hearing. The fourth point, uh, and thank you, Paul, for our discussions over lunch today, is focus on solutions. I've actually spent the past three days saying repeatedly, I know what the problems are. They're staring me in the face. What actually are you saying are the solutions to this? Focus on finding a way forward.
forward, not just repeating the problems and then looking uh, at the judge and saying, it's a very complex situation, as we all used to do in debates as undergraduates. And the final point to those who are involved professionally is remain professionally detached. And that applies to the lawyers uh, as well. You are helping nobody if you lose your detachment. It is a gross simplicity to say that there are uh, three categories of behavior, adult, parental, child, but just allow me that naive uh, analysis for a moment. If you get a judge who, who gets terribly frustrated with the alienating mother uh, and speaks uh, in language that is full of passion, what is that judge? How is that judge behaving? Is the judge behaving like an adult? Or is, in fact, the judge being reduced to the level of behaving like a child? Are other professionals behaving at that childish, reactive level? So remain professionally detached. And if you do that, as I did uh, over the past three days, I hope, and watch what people are saying and ask yourself, why is she saying that? Why is he saying that? You will learn far more than actually taking their immediate words and getting terribly emotionally bound up yourself. So those are the five points. What's happening? Get emotional help. Be consistent. Focus on solutions and remain detached. So this is now uh, the PowerPoint. What is parental alienation? That's the definition. A process and the result of the psychological manipulation of a child into showing unwarranted fear, disrespect or hostility towards a parent and or other members of the family. Is it a syndrome? Who cares? What does it matter? It doesn't matter whether it's a syndrome. Isn't calling it a syndrome simply a, uh, uh, a desire to pigeonhole a set of, fa set of facts that arise in particular circumstances. Far more important to look at the facts of the case than try and slot it into some form uh, of preconceived uh, idea. What have the courts said? Well, that's Mrs. Justice Parker. I regard parental manipulation of children, of which she sees a lot, as exceptionally harmful. It distorts the relationship of the child, not only with the parent, but also with the outside world. Children who are suborned into flouting court orders are given extremely damaging messages about the extent to which authority can be disregarded and given the impression that compliance uh, with adult expectation is optional. Uh, and she uh, then goes on to look at the facts of the case. Very often, one of my children will get up and say, I don't want to go to school. Well, just imagine if I said, well, do you know what? Let's do a wishes and feelings analysis. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell you what, I don't want to go to work. The idea of sitting in court, being bombarded by things, I I I'll take the easy option too. You don't say that. You, don't say, you just say, look, get out of bed, put your clothes on, you're going to school, uh, and you uh, hurry them onto the bus. Um, we had a mention of Childline. Can I mention your story? If my, if my son ever sees this, he, he'll want to kill me for. But uh, he, uh, uh, one morning uh, he came down and he said he was going to ring Childline. Uh, and I said, oh, really? Why? Because you won't make me bake beans. <laughs> really? So I handed him the phone and said, look, there's the, there's the phone, here's the number, ring them, buddy, ring them. And what I then went on to say probably would justify a call to Childline in any event. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so what is the problem? The problem is actually in the second of those bullet points. I was bored in a lecture. Uh, I, don't, I have uh, the attention span of Dory in Finding Nemo. Uh, I'm bored listening to some hard-letter law lecture. I sat with another judge where we are identifying these points. The problem with parental alienation is it's not about the child at all. It's about the adults. It, it is about adult issues. It is not child-focused. It's the process by which one parent's emotions dominate a child's relationship with the other parent. So it's about the dominating uh, emotions of one parent. And it's using children as an instrument of that parent's skewed emotions. So it is, in every sense, wrong. It <coughs> it unrestrained, as I say here, it causes a child to reject one half of its own natural background and genetic makeup. So the child 
age 15, looks at himself in the mirror, thinks, I look like my father. But my father is the most evil monster in the world. I hate myself. And that's extremely damaging. Um, and that's what leads to those horrible consequences uh, of which Sue was talking, where, where children can themselves be self-harming and indeed suicidal. And there's another point that arises from the splitting about what, which we heard. If you in, encourage children to think in black and white terms that people are either good or they're bad, what are they going to do when they grow up, when they form relationships themselves and find problems with their partners? As we all do, no relationship is perfect. They're then going to engage in splitting in that relationship and that's why, I'd suggest, Children who've been alienated are at severe danger of themselves becoming alienating parents. Uh, and I'd stress that point. Uh, and it's obvious, if you think about it, why that occurs. Split the child as an adult. That's what's going to happen later on. So it causes short-term and long-term harm. Uh, and the other long-term really destructive point is this. I, if a child is taught that it's acceptable to reject one parent, why shouldn't the child apply exactly the same logic to the custodial or residential parent when difficulties arise? When the child is 15, there's uh, <coughs> some slides missing, and that's my fault. Can I begin... Uh, uh, this next point by looking at what does it feel like to be the alienated parent firstly and I've never been in this position but I've seen it firstly it is deeply painful what more painful thing than to know you've got a child and you're not allowed to see the child because someone says it relates to who you are the person you are is such that you can't even see your child it defies nature <coughs> It, is, um, it leaves a sense of deep isolation. It leaves a sense of deep frustration, uh, unfairness, and powerlessness. What about the alienating parent? We talk about the alienating parent as though that parent will in fact be powerful. O often not. And what I've witnessed in a number of cases, the sheer sense of powerlessness that exudes from the alienating parent. The sense that she or he is so unsupported that the family unit has to close down in on itself uh, and ring fence itself in the terms that Sue described earlier on. Uh, and so powerlessness, isolation, fear, anger, rejection, all those combine. What's it like for the child in that? Not the nine o'clock news did a comedy sketch that I better not repeat here because it descends <laughs> into uh, appalling language. But it starts, would you ask your mother to pass me the milk? Would you remind your father, last time I passed him the milk, he tipped it over my head. Would you remind your mother, that's because she just spent the night on the town in the arms of a lover. Would you remind your father, that's because he never gives me any form of sexual gratification. <laughs> and the child is in the middle. And it then descends to even worse than that. How does that child feel? That child is being used. And that's the point. Because when that child grows up, that child is going to feel that his or her emotions have been ignored, neglected. Uh, so for the child, it is devastating. For the alienated parent, for the alienating parent, and for the child, uh, it, it is a, a highly damaging uh, environment, uh, dynamic. So <clears throat> what, what, what do we say? Well, the law's easy. It's all very well as a judge. You come out with these terribly ritzy things about Article 8 of the European Convention and the case law that goes on for pages. Of course, Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights is engaged, whilst it remains on the statute book. That means that uh, seeing your child is an essential feature of family life. That feature of family life should only be prevented insofar as is necessary to protect the welfare rights of the child, 
proportionate to the proven circumstances of the case, and thirdly, legal, and by legal, we mean in the uh, paramount interest of the child under Section 1 of the Children Act. And yes, of course, the test is that there must be exceptional circumstances demonstrated by cogent reasons before the court concludes that it would be in the interest of a child for all contact with a parent to cease. Uh, and uh, both parents have a legal duty to support the child's relationship uh, with uh, both parents. All realistic avenues must be pursued. In a sense, it's very easy to say that. Indeed, uh, I, I write novels. I'm trying to, I've written one to try and raise money to uh, give therapy to young parents, and we're just about to uh, release it for the uh, charity. Um, uh, but in another book, I describe a horrible judge who is already writing the judgment before he goes into court and just fills in the blank. I find there are the following cogent reasons why, in these exceptional circumstances, there should be no contact. And because he's a foul, useless judge, he just fills in the blanks. It doesn't happen in practice, I assure you. Yeah. <coughs> um, so, what do we do about it? Wishes and feelings reports. I, I have this real problem with wishes and feelings reports. You you've got an alienated child. Tell me, how do you feel? Well, I'll tell you how I feel, because I, 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 I'm living in this environment with an alienating parent, uh, and I'll tell you, I, I, I don't want to see my father. The problem with doing that is that it, first of all, doesn't tell you anything new, but actually it reinforces the difficulty, because now you've got the uh, professional person saying what you say about your wishes is, is uh, going to be the sole ambit of my work. All I am doing is listening to your wishes and feelings and I'm going to report them to the judge. It doesn't help. And also, what is the influence? You'll see on the um, slide there, what has happened? Do you really want to see that? And you can fill in the blanks yourself. And if so, why? I saw that happen outside a court in Bristol. That man, the mother said, outside court, uh, to the 15-year-old pointing at the father, that man is the personification of evil. That was just after Her Honour Judge Hazel Council had spent a very long time in a judgment saying that the mother mustn't denigrate the father in front of the child. <laughs> so yes, okay, we can have wishes and feelings reports. I, 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 for myself, don't find them particularly helpful, and I don't know if others do. Are they, are they simply an easy and lazy, overplayed card in a very complex game? What about indirect contact? Isn't indirect contact the same? And I found myself saying in a case where indirect contact was being recommended, but she's only three. <laughs> now, what is she going to do? And how do you write to a child you don't see? How do you do that? What is it actually like? I put that on stage. We had a 17-year-old uh, actor from uh, a uh, college. We put on a scene. He's in prison. He had been supplying ecstasy to his mates. Uh, was the scene that I scripted. Uh, and he's told he can only write to his child. What does he write? What can you write? And then the letters that are written are produced in court and picked over in court. And any word that is out of place is then used uh, as demonstrating that the person who's written the letter uh, is not a suitable parent uh, and should not be allowed to see the child. It is impossible. In fact, what I see happening through the use of indirect contact in this way is that it adds to further distance the alienating, alienated parent from the child. And into what environment are the letters going? The letters are going into the alienating environment. So how could that possibly create a cure? And how could it possibly uh, be expected to surmount the difficulties for the child in that environment? It won't. So uh, uh, I'm not speaking in favor of that. How about changing residence? Well, I've done it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and it's an enormous carve-up. Uh, and how regrettable to completely change a child's environment, to change the child's uh, bedroom, friends, social connections, expectations, living arrangements, and to say, you will now go and live somewhere possibly completely different. You may even have to change school. It, it is uh, a, an immense thing to do. Sometimes it's necessary and I've done it. 
you have to be extremely careful that you're not being punitive. You have to ask yourself, not, I've said will it work, is it genuinely in the best interest of the child? Suspended residence orders are of course available to the court uh, and Mr Justice Coleridge, as he then was, w was the person who in effect invented them. You can only do that, and I will only do that, where I really mean it, where I really mean, if you don't do what I'm ordering, I will transfer residence. It is not a weapon. Lack of re legal representation. What's the problem in tractable cases? No professional filter. How do you dra uh, draft the documents? The, some of the parents may well not understand the full uh, extent of the issues. There's no money to pay for therapy, psychological input, drugs, drink, or other services that may be of such importance. Uh, and of course, the whole case is driven by emotion. There are things you can do, and there are things that I do, I was describing over lunch. Um, well, this is what Lady Justice King said, so it's not just me. Uh, this case is yet one more example of formidable difficulties faced by unrepresented parents. Statistics. Now, what's been said about them? Well, those are the statistics that I've been able to find. Uh, in 80% uh, of private law cases, at least one party is not represented. We see it a lot. What can go wrong? Delay. Delay is the biggest enemy of the lot. The constant, constant ordering of reviews. Seven years I've just seen of reviews. Um, at, at, with, a, with a hearing without a transcript in the middle of it that I know nothing about. Uh, it, it, it doesn't take the case anywhere. It leaves the problems in existence and they just continue to build with the parents seeing themselves, seeing each other at court for reviews with all the anger unresolved uh, and increasing because of things that they say in the proceedings. You see an accumulation of issues and hostility because statements are filed and they're not going to be nice statements. They're not going to say, actually, I think he's a nice chap. They're going to say exactly the opposite. And they're going to say things that, that are not true in the mind of the person reading them. Frustration, polarization, stress for the parties, expense, burden for the court, lack of progress, resolution or resolve. Um, lack of identified function. What is the court doing when all it is doing is reviewing? Is there a simple solution? No, but we can support litigants and better, uh, and perhaps you can see from the way that I speak just how strongly I feel uh, about supporting litigants in these circumstances. The best lack all conviction, the worst are full of passionate intensity, said Yates. Well, I'm one of the worst, because uh, uh, I have tried my utmost in the Bristol area to put as many systems in support, uh, in place, to support litigants. I have no, nothing to say about legal aid. That's not my province. I'd be a lousy politician. I'd get bored stiff in about five minutes. But I've got a job to do, and actually, as the court, that gives me a responsibility to put in place the best system that I can in that role, and that's what I'm trying to do. And if you can help me, please do. Um, my name's Matt Price. Um, my experience um, of parent alienation has been sort of 18 years. Um, one of the, the things that I've struggled with, um, I left school with no qualifications in dyslexia, and I was I've been to court 37, 38 times. So and I've been struggling with dyslexia all the way through this process. So I've got that learning disability, so I'm trying to interpret law, and it's been very difficult. Um, I've not had the financial means with which to hire a barrister, who's very more, more articulate than me. Um, so my, my sort of, you know, and I just started getting somewhere, and then I managed to get to a circuit judge eventually, um, and they said, right, comes back to court, uh, penal notice, and it's all good. Um, I went back to court, and that judge retired. So I was back down, you know, start, starting all over again, and, that, and I just completely disengaged from the whole process. Um, so my question is, bearing in mind, it's 
I'm guessing it's predominantly working class men who do struggle sometimes with education, maybe. Um, I wonder what aspects of, um, you know, dyslexia, for example, is taken into account in this process. Because I've gone into a, you know, I'm, I see a number of sort of young lads who are starting out, you know, in, in, in court and they ask for a leaflet. And I'm just thinking, my God, that was me 18 years ago. And yeah, so what, what part no, does, it, does, does dyslexia play a role or is it sort of taken into account can, in the judicial process? Okay. Can, can I, however, say, first of all, if I may, if, if I may the, the pain that you feel, it was quite obvious. Uh, and I'm really sorry about that. Uh, it's exactly the point that I've been trying to talk about. It, these things are immensely painful and there's nothing more painful than being caught up in this sort of dynamic. And to go to court 37 times, again, makes the, uh, the point that I was referring to. What is the point in going to court 37 times? It should not be necessary. I don't agree that this is working class. I'm afraid it transcends all class. Uh, indeed, some judges may say that amongst the middle class, uh, th those who think they've got a bit of uh, understanding, but not, not so much, uh, th there are particular problems because they try to intellectualise what's happening on top of everything else. So I don't accept that this is working class, middle class or upper class. It, 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 is, uh, it, it transcends all classes. As to dyslexia, um, to what extent is it take, taken into account? Quite obviously, it should be taken into account. Sh so should any disability or difficulty, which is why there must be much more support within the system for people like you and uh, others who, who have other difficulties, so that they can then access justice. Um, quite simply, there's no such thing as inaccessible justice. If it's inaccessible, it isn't justice. If it's justice, it cannot be inaccessible. So I'm sorry if you feel you didn't have the support uh, with dyslexia uh, uh, that, that you should have done. Uh, and perhaps that's another example uh, of how the family court, certainly I hope in Bristol, serves an educational point, uh, function, to educate people, but also should serve as a center which um, uh, then so helps people obtain the support that they want. And I'm very sorry you didn't get it. Uh, you put your hand up carefully. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the talk. Really appreciate the steer. With an independent judiciary as we have in this country, what, shall we say, assurances or mechanisms can you suggest to us that are in place to disseminate your thinking amounts that judiciary that we all engage with. That, that, that's very kind. Um, thank you. I'm doing my utmost to do that. I ho have open conferences, open debates. We've set up a theatre group to put all these things on stage, as I referred to. Uh, I'm writing novels. I'll write scripts. I'll do anything you want to, to, to do this. Okay. <laughs> yes. One, one last question. Tim Griffiths, uh, FNF Barnum. Um, a lot of the occasions we were in court were in private family law. We were talking about a, emotional abuse at levels which should, in theory, hit the threshold criteria and move over to public family law. Why is there such an in a difference between public and private family law in controlling these areas of law when there's emotional abuse? Uh, again, you're looking at literature in person that when you go to public, you will then have legal aid to be represented as well. Is that a solution, that it moves over at an early stage into public family law? It's a very good question indeed, if I may say. I, I've, uh, and there, there is a, 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 a very good point within it. Uh, I, I had exactly this difficulty, uh, and uh, I emailed a number of uh, other judges. We couldn't find a solution. We, we managed to find a solution to get somebody legal, uh, legal aid, uh, by, because it was a case that would justify a direction under Section 37 of the Children Act, and then I could make an interim supervision order, which created it into a public law uh, case. It, that's a device which you can only use very rarely where it's justified. Um, why, are not, why are these cases not becoming public law cases? That lies with the local authorities, and I have no power to force a local authority to get involved beyond the section 30, use of Section 37. Um, uh, it, it's a mechanism I've tried. Go ahead and follow up. If you had a case like that, one would consider that uh, an ICPC would be appropriate and that a full interdisciplinary look at the children of the family would be appropriate with a 
core group meetings, so forth and so on. That never happens. And yet that's the way in the background that this case is to be dealt with as a global, with both parents involved and all other schools, uh, GPs and all the rest of it involved in a disciplinary case. So referring it to social services or an ICPC to get the risk levels to go through a core group meeting well. And if it is that bad, move it back to PLO. Very good point. Um, I've certainly my experience. I don't know, Francesca, if yours is, but it is that local authorities generally are very hesitant mm. to get involved, um, uh, and that's a, a, another whole arena. I don't. Know. I agree. I also think the problem with that. I think it's a great idea, but if you've got disputed allegations, and let's just say, for sake, what the mother is saying, no, 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 he is uh, sexually abusive, or he's so emotionally abusive that X, Y, or Z has happened, you will find complete resistance from those professionals that are supposed to be convening meetings and things to making determinations until the courts resolves it. But it's, I mean, it would be good if we could get early resolution of things which were in the ether um, in a straightforward case. I think it's a good idea. I think the, the, the point, though, that you make can be reinforced. It, it, what, what I'm saying is the court must get involved. Once the case comes into court, it should be listed in front of a judge. There should be a judgment. There should be a transcript. And that then records what's happened. It's at that point, actually, that the judgment might be released to the Director of Children's Services for, for intervention. And also there can be a direction for social services to prepare a report under Section 7 or Section 37. You're not going to get it into the public law arena without a struggle, however.